and I'm a bookseller here at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to this PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format and in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books to our Politics and Prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the three titles that will be discussed tonight, Susan Brianti's Defacing the Monument, Tango Eisen Martin's Heaven is All Goodbyes, and Mark Nowak's Social Poetics on the Politics and Prose website. Additionally, you can ask the panelists a question by clicking on the Q&A box, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. While our panelists will try to get to everyone, everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. Finally, I wanna thank you all for being here with us today. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers on radical imaginations. Susan Brianti is our moderator tonight and is the author of four books, including The Market Wonders, Utopia Minus, Pioneers in the Study of Motion. She is, she is a professor of creative writing at the University of Arizona. Her most recent book, Defacing the Monument, is a narration of Operation Streamline Hearing, a proceeding during which as many as 70 undocumented migrants are criminally prosecuted and sentenced en masse to serve jail time prior to deportation. Tango Eisen Martin is the author of Heaven is All Goodbyes and Someone's Dead Already. Heaven is All Goodbyes was shortlisted for the Griffin International Poetry Prize and awarded the California Book Award for Poetry and American Book Award and a Penn Oakland Book Award. Mark Nowak is professor of English at Manhattanville College and the author of Cole Mountain Elementary, Shut Up, Shut Down, and Reverence. Social Poetics is his most recent book, which documents the imaginative militancy of a new insurgent working class poetry community rising up across the globe. All right, Susan. Thank you so much, Aisha, and thank you all for lending us your attention in these hard times. It's not easy. It's not easy to focus. It's not easy to, to tune in. So, and, um, and you don't, it's not a class. So just remember, you, you can lie down, close your eyes, let us drift you off to sleep, whatever feels comfortable for you. Um, but I just want to say that it, it's, um, I'm really grateful for the presence that people have had for discussions around art and poetry in these times when there's so much pulling at our attentions. So we thought tonight we'd do something a little different and have a conversation between the three of us. Um, and and I, will, I will confess, I am really, really excited to have a chance to speak with Tango and Mark around this idea of um, social poetics and um, the ways in which poetry can be used to, to organize, to change people's thinkings around things. Um, so we just thought we'd start off though by asking Tango to read a poem for us. I, uh, I go to the railroad tracks and follow them to the station of my enemies. A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative. All over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big cosmic basket and why blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho spiritual refusal to write white history or take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm, ricochet sewage near where I collapse into a rat infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti. In the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up. House of God in part, no cops in part. My body brings down to Christmas. The new bullets pray over blankets made from the old bullets. Pray over the 28th, 28th hours next beauty mark. Extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration the waistband before the next protest poster. Uh, by the way, Time is not an illusion, your honor. I will save your desk for last. You are witty, your honor. You're moving money again, your honor. It's only raining one thing. Non-white cops and prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk flowing on an oil spill in the neighborhood, making a lot of fuss over its demise, a new lake for a Black Panther party. 
Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder, the fig in the village, a new noose to a new white pe preacher, all in an abstract painting of a president. It bought slavery some time, didn't it? The tantric screeches of military boats in election Tuesday cars, a cold-blooded study in leg irons proved that some white people have actually found those nooses. The sundown couples made their vows of love over opaque peach plastic and bolt action audiences. The Medgar Evers second is definitely my favorite law of science. Found the news clippings and primitive Methodists. My arm changes imperialisms. Simple policing versus structural frenzies. Elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums. Artless bleeding and the challenge of watching civilians think. Terrible rituals they have around the corner. They let their elders beg for public mercy. I, I'm gonna go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads and the arrows myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest. Modern fans of war, well, well with their t-shirt poems and t-shirt guilt and me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on the bus, I have no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. I talk facing away from the dead. They, they replace me with the change in my pocket, a, a penny that's yet to be invented. They say, you have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting the throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, I became content with the small gestures of plantation fires. I mean, playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. It exists in so many places, so many random things that interrupt me while I'm trying to dream, like your clay correspondence, Lord. To be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind, explored what's naturally there, and I found no brainwashing. I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diasporic South. I have morning possessions, modern militancy. I mean, windows to the South. I will walk on a missile for food. I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country? I'll murder merge with us, Lord. Our old metal versus new metal, our old metal versus a pool of meandering imperialist faces of multiculturalism, a source of you know, the dead replaced me with a comedian's chest cavity instead of a chest cavity held tight. It takes a violent middleman for me to talk to myself. Stories that travel through other people's stories, a song about a song, a hemisphere about a hemisphere, stories that travel through a conquered poet. And my mother remembers Africa, Lord. She killed on behalf of you, Lord. I wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant. I read 1,000 books in front of the world. You know, what I do is fight poems and sleep through decking in San Francisco prayer circles, watch people play for post-working class associative surfaces or recreations of a governor's desk, you know, ruling class art of utility, playing find a sociopathic bureaucrat, a day some white people scare even easier, TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby wearing ceramic armor, musket progeny, fantasizing through the art of the poor, their trendy latches locked before God, black art hunted down like a dog and hand over my friends lord lord, lord i think i'm gonna die in the war uh, unelected white people in my small house like a blue song of no spiritual effect a dollhouse ace bomb a pony show near dead bodies apartheid weddings that go right apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians the spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations a chemical interpretation of a sunday trip to church church smells in their pockets a river mistaken for a talking river no autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use made in the image of god's trinkets a white abolitionist confided in their children about chemical assurance is that they will switch from black artists to white artists, from black God to white God, from black worker to white worker. You know, I think about, about you cautiously, Lord. And in the same way I think about my childhood. Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is muted. Comedian points out a planter's field to a priest. King Sugar King, King Cotton, King Revolutionary, the Bible Central, containing all modes of shallow introduction, introducing an unlisted planter class, speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masters that we could figure out our fathers later. You know, a priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of parishioners, re raveling fantasies about black art. Priest reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. You know, after the day, I've never been a poet before. A little brother watches his big brother's friends. They, they lean rifles on sheltered walls. They agree with me and call it literature. You know, it's a simple matter, this revolution thing. To really lie to no one. To keep nothing godlike. To write a poem for God. Yeah. Mm. That was beautiful. <laughs> right on. Mm. I said it was in school, but I didn't say it wasn't going to be church, even though I didn't know it before we started. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Um, I, I, I mean, I have a simple question for you both, and it, it just, it, it comes out of, um, out of my own background, right? I grew up in a, in a family tradition, transitioning out of the working class. I didn't have any poets around me. I became a journalism major because I thought that's how you became a writer when I went to college. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered how, how did you both find poetry and then maybe 
if you want, say a little bit about how poetry or how poetry found you. How did poetry become part of the, the activism that you do? Tango, you want to go first? No, please. All right. Um, well, first of all, thanks to uh, everybody for organizing this uh, and putting this together. It's great to be here with you. Um, you know, I, I would say that when I was about 15 or 16 years old, I started working at a Wendy's in Buffalo, New York, uh, and where I worked for eight years, the entire Ronald Reagan presidency from 1980 to 1988. And uh, a friend of mine gave me a tape, cassette tape of uh, this record uh, called uh, The Man Machine by Kraftwerk. Uh, and I never heard music like this. It wasn't what people in my neighborhood listened to. Uh, you know, they listened to, I don't know, Led Zeppelin, whatever it was. And I heard these four German guys with this kind of electronic beat and synthesizer. And I just, uh, I kind of knew I had to do that. Uh, so the, the Moog factory was in Buffalo and I bought a cheap Moog synthesizer and uh, got all their other records and started playing, started bands and played and wrote lyrics and played in nightclubs in Buffalo and Toronto and Rochester and elsewhere. And that was really how it happened. You know, I was in community college. I took a creative writing workshop to like write better lyrics for my electronic goth band and you know, here we are. That's how it started. Right. Um, uh, um, I, I got, you know, I, I got lucky um, uh, just um, be, being raised, really being raised in, in, a, in a revolutionary headquarters of sorts. Um, and also going to an elementary school called Meadows Livingstone in, in San Francisco, which was like a really like a, a freedom school. Um, art um or black art was always presented to me as just um you know uh, just just an, uh, to to go along with height and width and depth just another dimension um of of reality especially a reality in which our genocide is always at stake and so art as the um as the the the, the the tool of not, not just identity, um, but but an identity an identity in the face of genocide or an identity necessary to resist genocide um, has, has always just is, is is has always just kind of been almost uh, down to my subconscious, just an accepted fact, um, and through that kind of you know, through that cradle. Um, you know, lines just started popping into my mind. It was it was the Langston Hughes poem in elementary school, and and it's almost like I'm I don't want to be too grandiose and said then I started talking back, <laughs> you know, but but uh, instantly lines just lines just started popping into my head, and and though it, it would be a long 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 time before I would self identify. Um, as a poet, I could, I, I did feel um, there was almost a visceral difference in the the, the usual train of thought and the, the train of thought that that produces um, poems. So, uh, and you know, it's we've grown closer and closer <laughs> over the years. Uh, myself in that train of thought, I mean. I want to, I'll follow up then with this, um, I was listening to, to a podcast, which features one of your poems on the Poetry Foundation website, Tango, and, and in the podcast, you say this, this beautiful thing, all I think a revolutionary is, is just someone who's having one human experience and is asserting that singular humanity in all of its expression. Poetry makes me a better revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I wonder if you could just unpack that a little bit. It's a little bit, I think, of what you're starting to, to lean towards mm -hmm. in what you were just saying is, is that relationship between, um, I feel like there's a, you know, for a lot of writers, revolutionary struggle or social struggle 
feeds the poetry, but it, it feels like something really special and important to think about it the other way as well. Mm -hmm. I, I would say there's um, uh, kind of two, uh, two, two, two threads um, uh, or two, two threads of that aspiration uh, for you know, poetry to be both a tool of revolution and a tool of cultivating a revolutionary. Um, one is the the you know the the counter to um, alienation at this point of everything. I mean, you know, I I I, I was my my first my introduction to that term was of course alienation of labor. Right, you give your labor, you sell your labor to a capitalist. Uh, but in doing so, I mean, along with it, the fact of it being that you're selling a piece of yourself because the interest of the capitalist is always contradicting yours, what you give them actually becomes the enemy um, of you. And you can say that for, I mean, at this point, you know, alienation of, of identity, really, I mean, alienation of, 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 of social existence at this point. Um, and so as a consequence, we live in these in these compartments internally, our internal experiences is, is, is compartmental and therefore makes us easier to dominate because if we're allow, if we allow them to make us not human in this situation, um, but maybe we can assert our humanity or our humanity is accept is acceptable here or you know our right to self-determination. Um, is 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 a lot. It can be allowed here, but over here you better be an object. Um, we're always um, we're, we're really always a, a, in danger of being deanimated and inhibited, and therefore we you know all the, you know they just all they have to do is you know put push a, push a few buttons and kind of maneuver us into social situations in which we're either going to. Uh, play dead or resist, and because we're living this hyper individualism, and have really don't have a lot of confidence in our collective ability even to protect ourselves, then we'll go to sleep. Um, and so, you know, to 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 undo, um, you know, to to undo those processes of alienation, uh, which is really just to to live critically. And to have a critical approach or approach any any thread of your existence, really with a critical conversation with yourself, and a critical conversation with you know with with, with your folks, and ultimately a critical conversation with your with with your oppressor. Poetry is a tool of of critical thinking. It is a tool of digesting the entire reality and taking the entire reality and then and then spinning it back. That's uh, like if if anybody gets a chance to read Bob Kaufman, I highly recommend it because that to me he he like that that's among a million groovy things. This is I think that's one of his huge strengths is that you can see the world has thrown all of this um, oppression. And, and then the you know the derivative chaos from that oppression and Adam and he just spits it back out um, in a in a in a beautiful and, and insightful way. Uh, so I'll say that's one. And then two, and uh, <laughs> luck, 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 luckily I I, I revisited uh, 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 Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed recently before I had to answer this question. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the one of the ways he describes this society as a, a necro, like a, a, a necrophilic um, society, and that we're actually walking around dead to ourselves, and can only and, and then and, and and can only be animated, are only animated through the bourgeoisie's permission or avenues provided by the bourgeoisie. So you have a, like, yeah, you can have a, a political life on November 3rd, <laughs> right? Before and after that, or not, if it doesn't pertain to that, no. You're dead to, you're dead to the creation of, of, of reality, right? And, and that goes on, you know, you're dead till you buy something. You, you're only alive when you bought something. You're only alive at this job, right? Or, or whatever else. Is is permitted by the ruling, um, by the ruling class, 
what um what do we come back to life with or or what's the um for for very beautiful you know one of his i think his beautiful contributions is the is the concept that that okay in order to come back to life or coming back to life is it starts in, in a in a very um in, internal place and it's and it's the place where you name your world and so it's the power of naming is where you know where a really a liberatory process um, uh, begins, or where you can reabsorb your power as a human being. So while we might not be able to reabsorb our military power, we might not be able to reabsorb our powers of, 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 of production or our place in the, in the in 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 in, uh, in productive forces, right? But we can reabsorb our power to name reality right now like this second <laughs> and and poetry um is the you know if there is if there ever was a a, a tool of naming that that that's what that, that that's what it, that's what it is so I, I would say this this is what this is how poetry makes me a, a better revolutionary Thank you. That was, that was amazing. So now now it is school because now I'm taking notes because I can't help myself <laughs> but uh Mark, do you want to follow up on that to talk a little bit about what your your study, your practice as poetry has? I mean, I know it's it's foundational to your organizing because the workshop is is part of your organizing, but maybe you can talk a, a little bit about that development or that relationship. Yeah, um, you know, I uh, for the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, the creative writing workshop has really been uh, kind of engulfed within this kind of capitalist institutional educational structure, right? More and more, if you have a poetry workshop, it's on a site where there's a pretty big production of student debt. Uh, there's a really horribly underpaid adjunct labor, uh, etc. And so what I wanted to do in the book was to look at how the poetry workshop had been used as an organizing political education force outside of those kind of institutions and in the community. And particularly looking at, at moments of struggle. And as I looked more and more at moments of struggle and moments of rebellion, very regularly the poetry workshop would turn up on the heels of that revolutionary movement and people would then find ways to tell that history to become kind of like people's historians of that movement. Right. And so the book kind of starts with the Watts Rebellion and then the Watts Writers Workshop that emerges out of that. And then the breakaway from the Watts Writers Workshop by uh, a number of the younger poets at that time, right? Quincy Troop, uh, Eric Priestley, Achenke, others. Uh, it looks at the Attica Prison Rebellion and the poetry workshop that happened right afterwards, which is the first Black arts movement poetry workshop in a prison was at Attica. Uh, and so that became a, a way to do political education, to create a space for, for people who are in that rebellion to tell this history of that moment from, from a participant's point of view. Uh, I look at the poetry workshops that Ernesto Cardinal instituted after the Sandinista revolution and trade unions in South Africa during apartheid who used the creative writing workshop to create an anthology of worker poems as part of the anti-apartheid struggle. So to me, there was, became pretty clear that there was this huge world in which the poetry workshop had been a, a device of political education and political action that just really hadn't been documented by anyone before. Uh, now, the reason for my doing that is because uh, a number of years ago, I founded a group called the Worker Writer School, which does creative writing workshops in collaboration with uh, workers movements. And so right now we're uh, in our 10th year in New York City in collaboration with PEN America. And we've got members from Domestic Workers United, uh, a group that passed the first Bill of Rights for Domestic Workers ever in the country. Uh, domestic workers and farm workers had been left out of the earlier FDR labor uh, legislation. Uh, 
because they didn't want to protect black and brown workers, right? Uh, farm workers and domestic workers, we can leave them out. Uh, but Domestic Workers United passed the first Bill of Rights uh, in New York State. So we have members from that group, from the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, from the Street Vendor Project, Picture the Homeless, a bunch of other groups. And we meet once a month around a table and we build solidarity through writing poetry. Uh, our Members have been at a number of protests, reading their poems, at a number of literary events, reading about their working lives. Uh, we've been working on a big project uh, the last almost year or so uh, with frontline workers uh, during the coronavirus writing haiku uh, daily about their you know, jobs, working in an MTA subway booth or taking care of someone else's kids or parents or all of that. And so it, it's become kind of clear to us that there's a real space for the creative writing workshop to be a tool used within these kind of organizing movements to get people both telling the stories of their own lives, but hearing uh, from other workers and other sectors who are doing different things and a way for them to build solidarity between these organizations. Yeah, that's that's amazing and the story that you tell in social poetics and the examples you give are really amazing and vital. Um, I wonder, and this is a question for both of you, because I know Tonga, you also teach workshops in, in various sort of movement or, or prison settings. Do you ever find skepticism towards poetry? Because I sometimes can't quite figure it out. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually in my, in the institution that has my labor right now. I'm at my office at a state run, a public university, and there's all kinds of going through budget crises and there's all kinds of skepticism about poetry. Um, do you find it, it is, is it just within a kind of middle class sort of, um, a, a, sort of a, an outpouring of the anti-intellectualism of the past 20 years that we've seen that people are skeptical towards poetry? Or do you find that there are folks, when you approach labor unions, when you go into prisons, who are also skeptical about doing a poetry workshop? And if they are, what is the thing that often uh, sort of breaks down that skepticism? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's always skepticism, right? I mean, people are always skeptical. Um, but one of the things I've been talking about a long time um, in one of my critiques of the kind of art world and the world of kind of activist art is that um, we haven't really taken into account duration, right? We have a tendency to do these one-off, like here's a one month workshop at a public library for a certain group of workers, right? Or here's a kind of six week workshop in this particular place. And then you're gone as an artist, right? You put in this installation artwork and people interact with it for a summer. Uh, I'm thinking of something like the Gramsci Monument in the Bronx, right? Uh, and, and then you, you fold it up and you take it away and people are left where they were at the beginning. And, and I think about you know, like in, um, in upstate New York by the Massachusetts border, right, rural community. And I, I go into the grocery store and I see uh, the cashier in the line, right? And she's behind the shield. Uh, she's maybe during the day, 50, 60, maybe even almost 70 years old, right? Behind that shield for six or eight hours. And she's certainly like, you know, having 10,000 thoughts, right? And maybe when she gets home, she shares those stories with her family or, you know, calls somebody on the phone or gets on a Zoom FaceTime like this, right? And tells about like, who is this person who bought nine bags of ranch Doritos and what is their life like, right? And suppose like she had the idea to write it down. Where would she go in our communities to do that? Like there are no grassroots organizations set up for her to kind of process and think and talk about that story, right? To share that with other workers, with the person who's a janitor at the school and the person who drives a truck or an Uber part-time in the community, right? And like how, like to me, it's a really a desire over the long term to create these spaces for people who have that thought and say, yeah, I, I want to get to, I want to tell the story and oh, here's someone else 
who lives across town from me who does a similar job and is having the same experience. And why is that? Like, why is that? Why, why do we have the same stories even though we're in these different places, right? And I also think about that cashier and like, we, we don't always think right away like, oh, this month of November, there's a workshop at the local public library and I'm gonna go to that, right? We might like be afraid to go to that workshop and we might mull it over for, six weeks or six months or six years, right? And then finally get up the gumption to go and do it only to find out, oh, we missed the dates of the workshop. It's gone now, it's over with, right? That's not the organizing. So at the Worker Writer School, we meet the first Saturday of every month forever. Like it's in my calendar for, I don't know, whenever iCal ends, that's where, that's where it ends, right? Because we need to be there like kind of constantly to, to, to create a space for people to come and, and write those poems and build that solidarity. And, and, I, and I would just add too that, that we, we need to go find out how much rejection is out there. I think we've been playing it a little safe, <laughs> you know, like until, until every single, you know, until every person tells me they don't want to hear poems or doesn't want to write poems, I, I'm going to assume there are people out there that, that need it. I, I was um, uh, lucky um, uh, to lucky enough to have a conversation with Emery uh, Douglas uh, uh, recently, and uh, Emery Douglas, you know, who was not 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 day one with the Black Panther Party, but like month three, <laughs> you know, and 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 did all of that uh, iconic art. Um, that is still being engaged in a in a very you know present tense uh, type of way. Um, it, it, you know the, the revolution really never ended and never ends. Um, and one of the interesting things he said, you know, one of his objectives with the art was just to to a, as an entry point to movement. Um, and 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 that that opportunity is is always is always there. I found in the most um, oppressed places, actually, poetry um, is is the um, is is the most embraced because it's 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 a, it's an instant uh, critical. It's an instant process of critical thinking that doesn't require a foundation anything other than your lived experience and then we're going to and, and and through the you know through through a, a, a political educational writing workshop then we'll synthesize more uh, material with with our with our lived experience but you can it, it just add water and, and, and you can go and 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 also in the in places in in, in the kind of the most wretched places one of the one of the major tools that our oppressors use is, 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 is actually monotony in, in numbing us, right? And so the opportunity, again, just to, to, um, to, to give your creativity, um, uh, to, to, give your, to, to give your creativity almost a biological existence um, is, is, a, um, is, 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 a, is, is a mighty weapon. In fact, I was, I was teaching a, um, I was teaching a creative writing class in a in a jail in Mississippi, and, and and one cat just said, "Yo, for 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 two hours, I just for these past two hours, I just transcended this jail." And, and that's the you know that's that that's that's the birthright of of revolutionary art um, that, that I think we actually can you know get bolder with, and. and, and you know, Really get our now it's really time to get our feelings hurt, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I, I was thinking, Mark, in your book, you 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 pose the question, but again, this is a question really for both of you about um, how might a new social poetics or this, which is this you know tradition you've established, that you've been talking about emerge from and collaborate with the new social practices of our time. And I just, I just wonder, there's so much media discourse right now. And it's true. I mean, it's, I don't mean to, to I don't mean to, to frame it like that as to, to say it's fake news, but there's like a, a, a narrative the media loves about the divide, a country divided, divided America. Um, 
you know, and there's, I mean, we're actually in a moment too, where like, it's, it's not just divided, but that there are people who are, I mean, we've always had people who live in radically different versions of America, but now we have people that actually live in radically different versions of reality, where like, we can't even agree on facts between them. Is there, um, is there a kind of social poetics that we need now? Is there a difference in what uh, what a social poetics, what the history of social poetics kind of has taught us that that would necessitate a change in how we approach it now? Or, or is it, as you say, just a, a, a question of duration or a question of continued presence? Uh, you know, I mean, if I had the answer to that, I would be making a lot of money right now. <laughs> right? And freeing a lot of people. <laughs> I would, I would, I do. You know, I don't, I do look at, um, you know, even the map of New York, I looked at after the election, right? And uh, it was pretty red for a state that went blue, if you look at it county by county, right? And so one of the things I've been thinking about is how to take this worker writer school model into rural communities to organize, right? And to get people around a table to talk about their jobs, right? And what does that mean? And so, you know, if you're driving a truck, if you're sweeping the floor, if you're working on a farm, like what if we bring those people together and then we bring some of the people from the Worker Writer School in New York City who are very different from the people in the rural counties, right? Christine Lewis from Domestic Workers United, uh, organizer there for many years, uh, you know, from Trinidad, a steel drum player. And she comes and we start writing together, right? And we're talking about these issues together. Like, is it, I don't, I don't know if as, political artists, we've started, we've really done enough in rural communities as cultural workers, right? Uh, and so it's one of the goals for the Worker Writers School. You know, we did one about four or five years ago uh, with the Worker Justice Center of New York working with migrant farm workers. And then we had uh, events in which they read their work uh, in different locations, right? And so this had been probably be for many people the first time they would have ever in their lives had a person-to-person -person interaction with someone who picked their food, right? And so how can we build ways to do that? I think here in New York, at least, I'm sure in California too, um, that, you know, there's a, there's a new kind of wave of young radical farmers moving up, right? Using new ways of farming, building new CSAs with kind of new political ideologies. And so I think maybe tapping into groups like that could be really important in this kind of work as well. And how do we how do we bridge this work that we do uh, in in different kind of geographical spaces? Uh, uh, I'll, uh, to, to to give a kind of a, a grumpy response, I, I, I you know I think what, what's going to be crucial now is, is actually more the emphasis more on the, the social than the poetics. I, I think now is just a, a crucial time for um, for organizing, for clarifying, you know, like what, what do we believe uh, true social transformation of the society is? And then what is then the, the principled program to, to carry that out? Because I think we have, I, I believe we have turned a corner of sorts. I, I believe there is now a kind of a more mass, um, you know, white paramilitary force now. I don't think, I think it's just the beginning for these, uh, for these folks. I don't think they're going to uh, disband any anytime soon. And, and, and they're, they're thrilled with their function because it, they it was well, the function that is what America was built on the repression uh, of of black and red people, um, but now the 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 kind of like the myth of, I think the myth of the bootstrap is 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 is, is fading. That well, what is there actually to do? We could live in um, you know uh, di different reality, or we could play along with our with our oppressors. 
um, or, or, or kind of par par parallel play up, play along because there was still some kind of semblance of a function outside of military reality. But as all these other ways of life or ways of being productive uh, uh, wither away, all they all they really have is violence. They're, they're only the, the the proof of their existence is is violence. And so, in order to um, in order even just to prepare um, to 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 meet that, it, it, it is going to require. Uh, a, a more um, a more energized organizing with a with a better political line than let's go put put our fate like you like I'm you know it, it, you know when I put my fate in the hands of uh, whoever when I put my fate in, if I put, well I didn't really technically put my fate in the hands of Obama <laughs> I saw through that from the jump but. Obama had police just had had police trying to kill me just like uh, just like every everybody else. Um, so, you know, it, it, and and I think the art will will come along for that ride. It is there's in no way to devalue the cultural work, and you know I, I've said it dozens of times that you know I quoted the Amokar Cabral take that it's 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 uh, it's our cultural uh, reality that determines our political reality cultural work is crucial um, but there does need to we, we do we, we do need a, a better a better politics and we need to make that better politics programming you know I like, I like really want to go into the politics discussion but but um, but I'll try to keep us a little more and I know we're gonna um, we're gonna to move to questions from the audience here pretty soon. So I, I just wanna know, do y'all have questions or comments for each other? I've been um, been happily asking you what I wanna know, but I, you know, I don't wanna keep you from asking my, each other my, questions. My, my, I just, just, you know, my, uh, my head, my head is off um, that, you know, just doing them uh, you're doing amazing work <laughs> you're doing an amazing job really uh, 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 um, you know the model for anybody that considers themselves a, a, an, an artist really an artist of, of the human project or an artist of the human journey needs to take notes on, on how you get down and where you get down so just my respect yeah, I mean, I would say the same thing, you know, and I, I think that Congo's point on the on the social versus the poetics was a was a really strong one. And it reminded me of, you know, Amiri Baraka. And, you know, there's this great book, A Nation Within a Nation by uh, Kamozi Woodward that, you know, you hardly recognize Baraka as a literary figure in that book because he's always with a new organization, right? He's always in a new political project. He's always doing, you know, everything from electoral politics to revolutionary organizations. And, you know, it, it kind of makes me a little nostalgic sometimes to read books like that because there were so many kind of, you know, organized groups of political artists and writers, you know, particularly outside the United States, uh, who were gathering, uh, you know, at, at various conferences and assemblies. And, and I feel like that's something that's really missing here, you know, like, I, I was doing these poetry workshops at the at the Ford plant in Minnesota when Ford announced this program, The Way Forward, right? And what that really means for capitalism is they're going to close 13 Ford plants and lay off 35,000 people. And I wrote and emailed all the other UAW unions and was like, hey, can we do this poetry workshop at, at your place too, like we're doing with the Ford workers in St. Paul? And I never heard back from anyone. And then I got a, a small grant to go to South Africa and I got in touch with the Union of the Auto Workers in South Africa, NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, and just said, you know, I'm doing this poetry workshop in a Ford plant uh, in Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, that's closing, and I'm coming to South Africa, and might it be possible to at least meet with you or maybe do a poetry workshop? And I got back like a two-page email that was, we'd like you in both the plants in Port Elizabeth and Pretoria, eight hours a day, two-day workshops, 
are you a vegetarian for our catered lunches? Here's the cell number, mobile number, the driver who will pick you up, right? It was like the, the antithesis between the United States and South Africa. And why? Because there's an incredibly long history of cultural workers and factory workers and farm workers all collaborating together. It's a, it's a tradition that's almost unconceivable here, but it's, it's the very fiber of, of, of that history of working together in a place like South Africa. And I'm, I'm theorizing here, but you can check me on it. I mean, is, is some of it that the, the right in the US has just been, you know, they, they played the long game and they will never let some of what happened, it feels like in the 60s happen again. Like there's there's not a social safety net. There's not, workers don't have the time. You know, like I just, I sometimes just think of this on a real like basic level and it just feels like, it, you know, people don't have the, the time to do the kind of organizing or creating that was even done. And that's not to shrug off responsibility for it, but it, it does seem like, you know, there's, we've definitely lived with a backlash through the past 30 or so decades. Yeah, I mean, I think in part, but that's one of the reasons we've been studying the haiku for so long, right? Because you can be on the subway, you can be in the bathroom, like you can be anywhere and have that idea and put that together. And there's a really long tradition we've been studying of, you know, people think of the haiku and they're like, oh, I wrote that in fourth grade or something like that. But we read like the Japanese American internment camp haiku, Sonia Sanchez haiku, Baraka has something he calls the loku, C-O-U-P, right? Well, we looked at the Etheridge Knight from the Attica Prison haiku, uh, Diane de Primus haiku, right? I mean, there's a really radical tradition of, of that writing in the United States, but unless you organize workers and organize workshops to study it, it's not going to happen, right? It's got, if someone's not just going to stumble upon Amiri Baraka's loku, who's the cashier at the bodega. Right? There needs to be some organizing on the ground that takes place to make sure there's a space for, for that person to come and, and learn those things and study those things. Right, And if you're talking about Baraka's loku and the Japanese American internment camp haiku, like you can get into lots of political discussions really quick around those two sets of poems. Sonia Sanchez haiku and Etheridge Knight and Attica, you're in the middle, you're in the thicket of your political conversations at that point all through talking about haiku with workers. And, and you know, and, I, and I'll just add that, you know, his, history is the graveyard of empires, you know? And it, <laughs> but for, for, you know, the, the almost the laws of the universe, the moves they make, the, 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 the repression they employ and institutionalize really just so the seed of, of their destruction or the destruction of their hegemony. Um, though we, there are definitely some equations we have to figure out as far as, um, you know, really a kind of a waking up process as well as the organizing process or as that really, you know, it, it synthesizes itself. Um, I, there, there's, no con, there's no condition, no set of conditions that uh, I, I think uh, re revolutionary th theory and revolutionary struggle can't um, adjust to. So <laughs> stay tuned, you know. <laughs> that gives me more hope than anything else I've heard in the past few weeks. <laughs> Let me say, I know that we have just about 10 minutes left and we had talked about maybe getting to a few questions from the Q&A. Um, let me see if I can. Um, there's a, there's a, an early question, Tango. If you could repeat the title of the text on authoritarianism that you referenced, um, I don't know if that was the. I believe the only text I referenced was Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I could be mistaken. You should go there, even if that's not what you want. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a there's another question. Um, what would y'all say to poets who are trying to reconcile their economic futures with considerations of degreed learning, MFAs, etc., and the certainty that these futures are typically held hostage by for-profit or exploitative conglomerates? Uh. 
Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> throw it on my side of the grill. Um, you, know, I don't, you know, I don't. One of the things I think that um, I'm really interested in, obviously, is is poetry happening outside the institution, right? And so it's, uh, you know, we have, I mean, we're, we're in this hierarchical capitalist system, right? You're supposed to sort of get a degree, get a graduate degree, you know, win a first book prize, win a bigger book prize. It all builds up to a smaller and smaller point. And so I guess what I'm talking about and kind of borrow, I borrow the term in the book from from the going to visit the occupied worker occupied factories in Argentina is, uh, is this notion of horizontalism, right? Like not building a higher apex, but bringing more people and in my instance, uh, workers about poetry, because I think the, the space of sitting around a table, right? Some good fresh fruit and snacks, like talking about kind of radical literature with working people is a really important kind of way to kind of work against these things, right? Like we have to build this solidarity some way, like and leaving a book of poems in the back of a taxi probably is not gonna do it, right? Like we, but we work with an organization that's, you know, unionizing, organizing taxi workers and bring them into the workshop. Then I'll get a phone call like I did at, you know, five o'clock in the morning saying, we're having a big protest at City Hall and one of the taxi worker poets come and, and read poems at it. Right then, we're kind of building this bridge between between working communities and cultural workers. Right, and we're opening up a space for that. It's not bringing in the poet as some kind of outside star, right? But building poets within organizations. Because you know, if you've ever been in a trade union and you get the newsletter, there are so many pie charts and graphs and uh, the statistical material, you just begging for a poem at that point in time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we got to find ways to, to produce that. But I really think this idea of, of like bringing working people together to write and talk about literature has has a lot of potential and that and that's not something that's going to happen inside the institution right and tango mentioned frary and when frary talks you know, in his books about the, the systems of schools right he's like we need to talk to the janitors and the cafeteria workers and the security guards and the parents and the crossing guards these are all part of the school community right so what if we had a writer's workshop at a university that included five students and three cafeteria workers and one of the security guards, right? And the person who cleans up overnight and somebody who mows the lawn. That's the kind of poetry workshop I'd like to participate in, right? Mm. Not like 10 people sitting at the foot of the quote unquote master, right? Getting feedback from each other, but having a conversation about what this place is where we all attend school, cook in the kitchen, mow the lawn, do some campus security, right? Let's talk about, you know, poems about police violence with security in the room. What, like, how would they read this poem? And how do students uh, feel about their relationship? And then how do the cooks feel? And how do the, the, the maintenance workers feel about it, right? And so I, I think we've got all these spaces that we could open up for poetry that we have capitalism has found various ways to, to just shut down, like zipper our mouths and let's not do that. I, and I, I would just add that, you know, institutions, uh, you know, uh, like this is how the ruling class reproduces itself reproduces its socialization, reproduces its validity, you know, the quest for the the, the quest for well-funded stamps um, does give, does will, will take your art and give it a life away from the the, the people. I, I don't, you know, at the same time, I don't want to like intervene in your fate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and and it's not to say there aren't um, you know so, some some groovy writers that have come through MFA programs, but if I had to if I had to choose if you if you were to put a gun to my head I, I I'd probably tell you stay away <laughs> stay, stay stay away from there um, or or all that to say is uh, of all things um, poetry you you can give yourself an education. 
you can definitely give yourself education. You can learn just as much um, and, and can get just as good. Like I, 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 I was schooled in the New York and Poets Cafe in New York. That's really where I got my my education. Um, you know, just just get as get as close to the people as possible. And you know, I, and I think you know if we need a half step. Um, you know, a, a half step away or a half step of arena, like really let's put together some kind of people's universities or people's programs or people's FA, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, take, and, and, take, and take it from there. Because right now, I mean, I think one of the reasons why a lot of art is suffering right now is because it's taking place too far away from the mass denominator. And, and I think what both of your work shows is that these there are these traditions that are totally ignored, marginalized, you know, by these institutions that are supposed to be, and by a, a, the culture that's, you know, of prizes that, of prizes and um, a claim, I don't know, you know, and, and that, that exists parallel to it so that, you know, people aren't teaching a radical tradition of the haiku in MFA programs. Um, so, let's see if I can pull another question. Um, one of the participants asked, "What might be the role of what might the role of poetry be in fostering a community and dialogue?" I'm thinking of poetry as both expression as well as facilitation, in the manner of Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication. I think you should go this time first. No, I, I don't. I, I I hate to admit I don't know who. Uh, what was it, Marshall? Uh, Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication. Yeah, I don't know what that is, and not not to say that it's not valid or that's not a genius, uh, but uh, I, I I mean, I, I, as far as nonviolent communication between us and our oppressor, uh, good luck. Now, <laughs> now, now, nonviolent communication with ourselves to to build our side of the contradiction. I mean, I think that's you know that's pretty much what we've been talking about. Um, but I, you know, no, we're not we're not going to say you know oppression is not a poem. <laughs> you know, uh, oppression is not a protest. They don't throw the oppression protest and then we're oppressed. You know. <laughs> They have a complete institutional, you know, well armed. They have these machines, you know. We have to build a, a, a build machines of our own. But I, I wish I could engage. I I, I, I apologize, but I, like, I'm not trying to be. What's the word? What is it? Facetious? <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm not familiar with the catch in your question. Yeah, I, uh, I'm. I don't know that work either, but. Um... One of the things I would say is that the poetry workshop is a one of the more interesting ones I had was the Ford ones I mentioned when I was in uh, the Ford plant in Minnesota doing a poetry workshop and then went to the Ford factories in South Africa. And uh, my wife made a video of some of the Ford workers reading out in front of the plant in the US and I took it to South Africa and played that video as one of the prompts so that workers in South Africa could write poems back to their colleagues, co-workers, comrades in the United States. And so there was this thing, right? Like the US worker, and then we came back, I came back to the, to the uh, Minnesota and then played a video of the South African workers for the workers in the United States and their poems that they wrote in workshop. And so the thing was that the workers in the United States, uh, white workers at the plant thought these were the people who were stealing our jobs, right? Like, they're going to South Africa, they're going to India, they're going to China, because they never had a chance to see or speak to a forward worker in another country ever, right? They just had these racist ideas about what was happening because that's what capitalism and the press and everybody told them. And then in South Africa, everybody thought that people who worked at a Ford plant lived in mansions and, and drove Cadillacs and, you know, they thought the pay was great. And so on both sides, there was this great learning experience through writing poetry back and forth to each other, a kind of a transnational poetry dialogue. Uh, 
And so I think to me, that was a good example of ways in which poetry could be used to at least build power on our side, right? I don't know if building power across, you know, uh, the kind of things we've been seeing recently at protests in the news, right? Uh, most recently in DC, like, I don't know if that's where poetry is gonna start, but I think we can build uh, a lot more solidarity on our side. The left progressive side is, has had a history of, uh, you know, inner firing squad type of battles, right? And so, uh, so I think to build a, a more, uh, more solidarity within the group and particularly across international borders is a really important one. Hi, all right, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you to Mark. Tango and Susan. Um, I just wanted to say, um, there's been this moment on Twitter about what radicalized you. And I think hearing all of you speak, you've brought it very effectively back to how poetry can continue to be that for us now in this moment. Um, so thank you to all of you. And I wanted to remind all of our attendees that your patronage is what continues to allow us to do programming like this. And we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sales to support them. So of course, please support our poets and support our bookstore. Um, the link for all three books, Defacing Monuments by Susan and Heaven is All Goodbyes by Tango and Social Poetics by Mark are available in our chat and on our website. Also for all of our members or anyone interested in supporting our store, our member sale does start tomorrow and lasts until next week. Um, we hope to see you either virtually at another event like this one or in our stores soon. And to all of you, please stay well, stay safe, stay strong, and most importantly, of course, stay well read. Thank mm -hmm. you.